Hello, everyone. Yeah, I had no idea what uh, David Hogg said, but I'm st still totally happy to answer questions about his lecture. Um, so uh, nice to see you. Um, for those of you who are confused, I'm not Mark Vogelsberger, uh, not a professor at MIT, not talking about structure formation. Um, instead, I'm going to be talking about something else that I'm not equipped to talk about, uh, which is statistics and machine learning. And so I am an experimentalist, and uh, my PhD is in particle physics. I use statistics and I use machine learning. I find them fascinating. I think they're exciting. I think they're powerful, interesting tools. But I don't have a formal training in statistics or machine learning. And this is sort of the situation a lot of people find themselves in these days, um, learning to use things that are outside of your area of expertise. But you know, as you grow up and become a, uh, an adult physicist, you just teach yourself this stuff, and then you find yourself uh, an expert eventually. So that's the way things work. Um, so I'm happy to find myself here. And um, I'm going to give you first a quick overview of sort of the scope of topics that I want to cover, so you have a, a sense of the landscape where we're going um, and what I'm hoping to accomplish, okay? So, and I noticed that you guys, this must be a theoretical community because you guys have the fancy Japanese chalk, right? Like chalk fetishists uh, among theorists. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm impressed you can tell the difference because I can't. <laughs> well, we'll do some experiments later and see if you can, really. If you can. Okay, so. All right, so my motivation in these lectures is to answer the following questions. Okay? Okay, question number one, why do we need to do statistics, right? Why do we have this whole field? Uh, what do we need to know about it? What's important, okay? Basic question number one. Number two is how do I read an experimental paper, okay? I see some new result from Atlas or from CMS, and they say blah, blah, blah about theory X, Y, Z. What does that really mean? What have they learned? Um, how do they calculate this stuff? Um, how do they know what they say they know? Do they really know what they say they know? All the ugly stuff that goes into preparing a paper, okay? Uh, and then a corollary to that is how do I reuse an experimental result, right? Um, Atlas has a limit on squigglyons decaying to three taus and two photons. You happen to have another theory, uh, squigglyinos, I don't know, the case does the same thing. And you want to know how does their result, because you couldn't convince them to test your, your theory because you're just a theory student or whatever, um, and uh, how can you use their result to set limits on your theory or on some other theory, right? Is it different from reprocessing the data? It depends on exactly how they present the results. So we're going to go through um, several examples. If they do this, then you do that. If they do this, then you do that. If they do this, then it's all wasted garbage and they shouldn't have even published the paper. Okay. Um, and then the last one is. Um, Where does machine learning help? Okay, because there's a lot of buzz these days about machine learning. It feels like everybody's just throwing machine learning on every problem. But I want you guys to understand wh why we need machine learning in the first place, right? Where, where is it needed? Where can it really help? And in the future, where is it beneficial? And what are the costs of machine learning, especially in the context of this, right? Atlas does a search for squigglyinos and uses a boosted decision tree that they do not include in the paper. Can you reuse that result for anything else? Short answer, no. Uh, so there's some real costs for using machine learning. So we should understand where to apply it, when to apply it, when it's going to be fruitful, what the future holds, um, and, uh, yeah, and, and the costs of it. Okay? So that's the set of motivations. This is what I hope that at the end of the week, you will have answers to.
Okay. And <coughs> in order to do that, here's my outline. All right. So first, we're going to start um, the very beginning. Okay. So the classical topics, what we mean by probability and statistics, um, especially as applied to the LHC. Okay, so we'll do lots of specific examples as applied to the LHC. Um, and then, um, let's see. Uh, we'll do, yeah, and then uh, the second half, We'll do machine learning stuff. Okay, um, how, why, where, all that good stuff. Okay, so today and probably tomorrow, I'll be doing chalkboard lectures on this stuff, and we're going to start from the very be beginning because you guys have a broad set of backgrounds, and you may know some of this stuff, but you may use other terms, and so I just want us to all have the same words we use when we talk about these topics. So I'll very quickly go through the very basics and get us up to speed. Um, and do, this would be chalkboard lectures. And then here, because I'll be showing slides and I'll be showing plots and results and stuff like that that are difficult to draw on a chalkboard, I'll switch over to using PowerPoint slides so you can uh, more easily take naps, okay? All right, questions about that before we get started? Will I be posting the PowerPoint slides? Sure, yeah. Yes, I will. Um, and they have lots of references in them to papers, etc. Okay? All right, so let's begin by gathering some data. All right, so how many of us are there? There's about 60 of us, is that right? All right. So we have 60 people. Okay, so uh, what fraction of you consider yourselves experts on probability and statistics? Okay. Zero experts. All right. That's fine. Um, I'm including myself in that number, absolutely. Um, how many people here have taken a class in probability or statistics? Okay. Well, we can see the effectiveness of that class in, in generating experts, right? All right. So... I've taken a class, taken a class, okay. Uh, how many of you think you could uh, elucidate the difference between Bayesian and frequentist inference? Yeah, all right, okay, so uh, down about 30 people. Okay, how many of you have written a program to calculate statistics yourself? Wow, okay, great. And how many of you have trained your own neural network to solve a problem? Okay. Um, how many of you are actually an AI pretending to be a human? <laughs> you just failed, right? You're no longer pretending to be human here, okay? Right, so that question cannot be answered in the positive. Okay. Great. That's good for me to know. All right. So, right. let's begin with the basic definitions of all the stuff we need to know. So we're all on the same page. I'm sorry? All right, great. All right, so definition of probability, right? So P is a probability on space S if and only if for every subspace A, the probability of A is greater than or equal to zero, right? So here's our space S, and this just says you have some space A, the probability in this space is greater than or equal to zero. Okay? 
So probabilities can't go negative on any subspace, right? Um, and so, you know, you can, if you like thinking about concrete examples, you can think about like dice, right? So the full space is Right, this is the full space of all possible outcomes of rolling one die. Um, and this just says the probability of any subspace is greater than or equal to zero. Right? There's no way to say um, if the probability of two or four is negative one or something, or negative point two. It's just, it's not meaningful. All right? What happens if there's a space somewhere outside? So like, to take the classic example of the die, that gets, that maybe the, someone's gambling for God and the die gets broken out. It comes up with both a six and a one to the seven. That's, is that outside of our space? How do we count the probability for something that we have to determine? Um, the assumption here is that the space describes all possible outcomes. And so then you'd need to expand your space to include that. But here we're working with a um, divine proof dice that uh, can't be broken. It's good to state your assumptions. Um, OK. If you have disjoint subspaces a and B, right, disjoint meaning non-overlapping, so here's B, then the probability of A or B is just equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. All right, that's pretty straightforward. That says the probability of 2 or 4 is the probability of 2 plus the probability of 4 because they're non-overlapping, right? And then you can imagine, because you're a theorist and you probably like to think about spaces like this, well, what happens if you have uh, a non-disjoint subspace, C, right? Well, then you can always just find uh, the portion of C which is disjoint and add this probability to this probability, right? So there's natural extensions to that. And then, of course, the probability for it to be somewhere in our space is one, right? You roll the dice, something happens. Unless the universe uh, is actually a simulation and it gets paused, something is going to happen. You are going to get an outcome um, here. And so the idea is probabilities are between zero and one, right? Okay, but this is a very simple case. You're just rolling a die. There's no preconditions. Your universe is started from a blank slate. Sometimes there are more complicated situations. Right? And things depend on things that happened before or, um, or trends, demographic trends, right? So for example, um, what if you said, well, what's the probability of somebody being a physicist? Phys, phys, uh, I can't even spell this. Have you guys ever noticed? <laughs> have you ever, ever noticed how much harder it is to spell on a chalkboard uh, than on a piece of paper or write on a chalkboard on a piece of paper? It's surprisingly hard. It's like a spatial dyslexia or something, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I had to do all of my exams as a first year grad student on the chalkboard because I went snowboarding just before finals and broke my wrist. And so I couldn't do this motion at all, so I had to, I could, but I could still do this, so I had to have all my exams on the chalkboard. That was excruciating. Um, so don't go snowboarding just before finals. All right, so say for example, you want to know what's the probability somebody's a physicist. Well, it turns out there's a big difference uh, between this, probability of being physicist given that you're male, and the probability of being physicist given that you're female, right? And um, this used to be a great example of discrete options, right? Because it used to be, well, there's male and there's female. These days we know gender is more of a continuum, and so I should probably modify this example to, uh, to be continuous probabilities. But let's just consider these two options for now, right? And so. These two things are, <clears throat> are not the same, right? And so sometimes you're interested in the probability of something happening given some preconditions, right? And so we call these conditional probabilities. Right? The probability of B <clears throat> given A, right? And then if you're interested just in the general topic, or like what's the probability of B given A, uh, for various outcomes, you can recover the probability of B by summing over all the possible A's, right? Probability of B 
given a i, right? And then you can weight them by the probability of those various outcomes. And I like to think of this as sort of like expressing it in a vector space. You know, you have all these possible uh, unit vectors, and this is the, uh, the unit vectors, and these are the weights along those unit vectors. I mean, it's a single, it's a, it's a single number, but <clears throat> it's uh, sort of analogous the way you think about it, right? And so, in general, the probability of being a physicist is the probability of being a physicist, given that you're male, times the probability of being male, plus the probability of being a physicist, given that you're female, times the probability of being female. Okay, so anybody have any idea what these numbers are? So the probability of being male is about 49%. Right? Probability of being female is about 51%. So yeah, pretty equal. What about these other numbers? What's the probability of being a physicist given that you're male? Any guesses? Three quarters? Do you think three quarters of all men are physicists? <laughs> you, sh you throw a dart into a crowd at the, uh, in Mexico City, and you get a three-third chance of getting. I'll take that bet. All right. um. I think this is the kind of just like gender. I think it should be self-declared. So if you consider yourself a physicist, you're a physicist. So what fraction of the population do you think considers themselves physicists? One in a hundred thousand. One in a hundred thousand. All right. Um, so how many physicists would that make in the U.S. then? 3,000 or so? 300 to 500, maybe. Yeah, it's, you're probably not wrong by a factor of 100, so we'll call that good. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, but, what it, but the numbers are probably different, right, for men and women still, unfortunately, although the balance here looks uh, better than historical averages. All right, so if this is, you know, um, uh, 10 to the minus 6, and this is 10 to the minus 7, right, then you can you can get um, a sense for what the probability in general is of being a physicist. And you see that these are conditional probabilities. They depend on this other piece of information. And then you have to know what the, the chances of those pieces of information. OK. Basic stuff. But probabilities are not always discrete, right? And so for those cases, we have probability density functions, right, which are cool. Um, and you say, f of x dx is the probability for x to be within x and x plus dx, right? And note that <clears throat> f of x is a PDF. It is not a probability, okay? So f of x has any positive value. It doesn't have to be between 0 and 1, right? Classic example is a delta function, right? The delta function is a PDF. Uh, it also satisfies the requirement a PDF is normalized, right? Integral over the space of options here is equal to one. And so a, PDF, a, um, a delta function, for example, totally satisfies this requirement. It is a PDF, even though the value at um, zero is much greater than one, right? It's a probability density function, not a probability. And you'll find that people who know a little about statistics, but uh, haven't thought about it carefully enough, uh, often confuse some of, these, some of these quantities. So I want to make sure we're all talking about it the same way so that we actually communicate. OK. Okay, and then you can have multiple dimensions, of course. Right? Say, for example, you have some theory with two masses in it, right? 
and have no place where it has a grid. Well, I mean, you could have a step function, right? The value is 2 and the width is a half, right? Yeah, anything with an integral of 1 works. Um, <coughs> um, okay, so you can think about joint PDFs, like say you have some theory with two masses in it, right? And <clears throat> you have some probability density. These are like contours of equal um, PDF, right? And it has some complicated relationship in these dimensions. Um, okay, and so <clears throat> then f of x, uh, f of m1, m2 is the joint PDF. Okay, the full joint PDF contains all the information, right? And then we can have the conditional PDF, right? That's f of x, uh, sorry, f of, for example, m1 given m2. <clears throat> and that's saying, you know, I'm going to specify some value of m2 here, and then I want to know what is f of m1, right? And so that's some distribution like this, it's the slice, right? Okay, um, another cool thing you can do with this, or another useful version of this, is what we call the marginal PDF. Okay, that's when you integrate one of them out. You say f of, for example, m1, m2, d m1, right, integrate out m1, for example. Um, and, so, and so that would give you a function just of m2, right? And so that's like, you integrate across this, and you get some function, right? This is the marginal. And so it's like weighting all the different slices, um, and, and integrating over it, right? And you notice here that we weigh all the slices equally. We're not putting any prior on M1. We'll talk about that later. But we weigh all the slices of M1 equally. <clears throat> so we tend to just the projection um, averaged over all of it, right? And these are subtle but important differences. You'll see later, like, are you going to, you could maximize this PDF as a function of M1. Uh, you could integrate over M1. You do all sorts of various tricks um, to the PDF. Okay. All right, so we're almost done rounding out our toolkit of terms and mathematical objects, and then we can get to using them. Okay, uh, another very powerful concept is the parametric PDF, right? Here you have. number of points in that thing. If there's a much bigger density of broader cross-section in that area, you would have more. When, when you marginalize oh. more, you more of it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, this thing has a, can vary in M1 and M2, and so the integral captures that. Uh, but you can imagine a scenario where you also include a term, right, okay. where you're weighting different values. The way over here, for the physics, physicist scenario, we didn't just say um, we um, add these two probabilities equally. We weighted them by the probability of them happening in the real world. That's what I meant. So here we're, we're treating every slice of M1 equally, although obviously they don't evaluate to the, to the same thing. Cool. All right, parametric PDFs, right? This is saying uh, we have a PDF on some data given some parameters, right? And so this can be theory parameters. Um, you know, and a classic one is a Gaussian, right? A Gaussian is a function of x, has two parameters, mu and sigma, right? And so these things go into the analytic expression of the PDF, right? And vary 
what you get if you vary the parameters, right? So, and so you, um, it's a, I think of it as a sort of a family of related PDFs. Okay, each one, you fix the parameters, each one is a different PDF, uh, but they're obviously related to each other. Okay, and that's very important when we want to do something like calculating likelihoods. Okay. Okay, so this is a key point here. Likelihood. Okay, so a likelihood of some parameters, right, is the probability okay, so sometimes we write likelihood and we, and we say x here after semicolon. The likelihood says you got some data. Now what's the relative likelihood of various parameters given that data? Okay, so um, it's a variation of the value of the PDF evaluated on the data with respect to these parameters. So you say, you fix your data, now you vary the parameters, and you ask, what are the likelihood of various parameters? Right, and so you might, for example, say, um, uh, you know, we have um, 60 people here, I'm going to guess we have, um, you know, the 10 blonde people, okay? So our data is 1 over 6, okay? Now you might ask, uh, what's the likelihood of somebody being blonde or the likelihood of the general population being blonde, right? And so... Right? And so if you have some model for, for this, like a binomial distribution or something, um, then this, uh, you know, my estimate would peak at one-sixth, but this is a, I'm very, I'm fixing the data. I'm saying I've seen a certain amount of data. Now what's the likelihood of various theory parameters given that data? Okay? Now a likelihood here, Notice it varies, right? And, and it's only, the only uh, relevant information in it is relative information. It's like uh, potential energy in that way. You add an arbitrary number to every value, it doesn't change what you know about this value of the, of the likelihood of this one or the likelihood of this one, right? This, the, the X scale is totally arbitrary. Right? I mean, just imagine adding a constant here. Doesn't change anything about the relative value of, of, of various thetas. I'm sorry. So I'm trying to read. So P of X given data. X is one sixth. Data. So probably one sixth of what? Um, all right. So. No, that's fine. It's fine. Uh, it's just a, a concept I thought up on the spot, so maybe it wasn't well enough formed. Let's um, let's do a more carefully thought out example. Um, say you have uh, something that you think has a Gaussian distribution, okay, um, and you have a few examples, right? Okay, you measure something, you think it has a Gaussian distribution, this is your x, okay? And then you might ask, what is the likelihood of various values of mu given what I've measured, right? I measure all these things, they cluster over here, right? Um, so this is, we call this, uh, Mu zero is the average value of all of my measurements. 
Okay? Um, and so what you can do is you can say the likelihood of various values of mu, right? And you can say, well, it's unlikely for the mean to be here. It's unlikely for the mean, for the true mean to be here. It's more likely for the true mean to be here. And we can get in later into about how to calculate likelihoods, but essentially this is a statement of the relative likelihood of parameters in my PDF. Here I've more explicitly spelled it out, given the data that I've seen. Okay, so you say, I have a family of PDFs. Each one gives a different prediction, right? So for example, this would be my PDF for mu equal to mu zero. I could have a different PDF for uh, mu equals two mu zero. I could have another PDF for mu equals mu zero over two, right? You just dial the knob on the parameter and you get a different PDF, right? And then you can make statements saying which value of this knob is more likely to have generated my data set. That's what the likelihood is trying to tell us. Okay. okay. And because it's only relative information, it doesn't matter if you add constants to it. And I'm sorry? Um, does it matter if you add constants? Oh, if you add a, if you add a constant, I guess you're wash, you're changing the relative strength of the information. If you multiply, then you're just changing the scale. Okay, yeah. You're right, I was thinking about log likelihoods. Thank you. Let's change that to a times. What is theta in this example? Theta in general are, are parameters. So here it would be mu and the width. And something that's very important to, to note is that the integral of your likelihood give over your parameters is not equal to one. Okay, your, like, your PDF is a function which is normalized over the observed data. Given a set of parameters, theory parameters, it's normalized over the observed data. It says, tells you the distribution of observing various events, right? There is no normalization condition over the theory parameters. So you can't take a likelihood and integrate it and expect to get anything reasonable, right? Especially because you could multiply by a constant, which would totally change the, uh, the normalization. So, so since this is the likelihood of Yes. Um, so we have the probability of, um, are we going to talk about this right now? No, that comes later. Um, okay, so your question is, um, we have the probability of x given theta, right? That's what we have. It's this PDF, for example. And we're interested in various values, the likelihood of various values of this, right? Now what I've constructed is the likelihood of theta given x, not the probability of theta given x. To calculate the probability of theta given x, we'd need to somehow take this, this likelihood and, and provide some normalization procedure so that we have, so it follows the rules of probability. We'll get to that. There's a Bayesian procedure that lets you do that, or a frequentist procedure that lets you do that, but this is not a probability, it's just a likelihood. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think I'm still just struggling with why that this definition captures the, I mean, the intuition we want to capture for a likelihood, but it tells you relative information. It doesn't give you absolute information, which is why you can't say it's a probability. It just says it's less likely for uh, this to have been your true distribution, your, your true source of your data than this. Okay, so it's really just relative information. Good question. Okay. All right, so now we have some basic terms. Let's think about how we use these things in the context of doing statistics for the LHC, for example. 
So, the most important part of doing statistics at the LHC So there's two steps. Okay, first we have to build a model. Okay, now that model is just probability of seeing some data given a various theory. Okay, and then we can do, use this model to do some inference, right? For example, to say what's the probability of various theories given the data that we saw, okay? First step is building a model, okay? And this is the hardest part. Now, this piece here, Bayesians and frequentists and other folks disagree about, right? There's various approaches to, for doing this. Everybody agrees about building a model, right? All statistical theory is based on building a model. And in fact, as an experimentalist, this is where all the important work is. This is how you dis are describing your data, right? We've built this apparatus. We collide protons at the speed of light. We detect things around them. What's the probability of seeing various things at that machine for various theories, right? We need to be able to do this. We describe the experiments that we've constructed, right? Why do you even build experiments? You build experiments because you hope to get different x's for different thetas, right? In some sense, the definition of, a, of an experimentalist is somebody who can figure out ways to ask nature uh, questions that have different answers for different theories, right? It's not useful to build an experiment that has no sensitivity to the theories you're interested in, right? So we try to build ones that can distinguish between various theories by give, giving different outcomes. In order to be useful, then we need to be able to describe the likely outcome of our experiment, right? Sometimes this is trivial, sometimes it's more complicated, okay? so. Let's talk about how we build, first we'll talk about how we build the model, um, its strengths and its weaknesses, and then we'll talk about how to do the statistical inference once you have the model, okay? All right, so remember x is our data, right? And it's really a vector, but I don't want to have to draw a line every time. Theta is our theory. Right? Um, but let's make this a little bit more concrete, right? X is our data. What do I mean by our data? Well, I could mean a lot of things. I could mean the raw output of Atlas, right? Anybody know what's the dimensionality of the Atlas data? Like every time we have a collision, how many pieces of information do we record? Order of magnitude guesses. Seven? <laughs> Seventy? Anybody? Sorry? Billions. Okay, wow. Well, let's go big. Anybody else? Sorry? Ten to the five? Okay. All right, so it's about a hundred million. Okay, so billions was not too far off. Yeah. Uh, the Carl Sagan answer. Um, so it could be, you know, this is the largest dimensionality of the data we consider, right? A hundred million. Now, very few people actually work in the data at this level, right? Most of the time we boil this data down to, um, you know, 10 to the 2, uh, using various reconstruction strategies. And then in the end, most analysis is done in a single variable, right? A single one-dimensional piece of information that boils a hundred million variables down, right? So, but uh, we're just going to write x here, and we'll talk later, when we get to the machine learning section of these lectures, we'll talk about whether we should be doing analysis here or here, whether machine learning helps us with this problem, but in general, we'll just talk about data, we could mean any of these things, and everything we say should apply to very, very high dimensionality or low dimensionality, okay? And theory here, theta is our theory, these are the parameters that define our theory, right? And so that, by that, I could mean the standard model, right, and your various sets of parameters that go into that. I could mean <clears throat> your various SUSY theory or your various theory of, you know, black holes or whatever, right? The this encapsulates our entire theory of particle physics, whatever we need to know in order to make these predictions of our data, okay? Now, if you hold theta fixed, right, 
then you get a PDF. Right? If you fix your theory, you go into MagGraph and you say, you know, import standard model or whatever, then you can make predictions for, for our data. Right? This is the prop important properties of the model. Fix the parameters of the theory, you have a PDF. And that just says our model is, is maybe parametric, but it's a member of a family of, of possible functions. Okay, so that's important. Um, we also need to be able to generate pseudo-data. Right? Now, any time that you have a PDF, you can generate pseudo-data. What do I mean by pseudo-data? I just mean draw examples from the PDF. So a brief aside on that. Uh, pseudo data. Um, right, so if you have a uniform distribution, if your PDF is just, you know, flat between zero and one, Right, then you can use a random number generator to generate uh, pseudo-data between 0 and 1. No big deal. Uh, if you have a non-uniform, right, then you often need to, when you're doing statistics, you often need to um, generate pseudo-data and say, I need examples of data drawn from this. Um, so that I can compare it to the data I've seen, or I can construct a statistical inference um, um, sets, etc. And so you often need to be able to generate data that, uh, that have been drawn from this distribution. And so uh, you can read more about it later if you're interested, but very briefly, uh, there's recipes for doing this, right, which are the basis of Monte Carlo techniques, um, and the algorithm is roughly one generate sum x0, right, so like here, for example, evaluate f of x0. So you have your PDF, you should be able to evaluate it at any point, right, so this is x0, this is f at x0, okay, and then you generate another random number Call it y0 uh, between here and the max and the max of your f. All right, so you generate a random number here. Maybe it's there, for example. And if y0 is bigger than f of x, then reject. And if y0 is less than f of x, then accept. Right? So any PDF, you can follow this recipe to generate pseudo-data from. And if you're looking for an intuitive understanding of this, essentially you, you scan ran uniformly across various values of x to make sure you're covering everything. At every value of x, you're asking, you draw another random number, um, and you're asking, are those random numbers bigger or smaller than my function? If your function is really, really small at that point, like close to zero, most of the random numbers are going to be bigger than it, so you will reject them. So you'll get very few samples where your function is small. If your function is large at some point, like here, then most of the random numbers you generate are going to be less than your function, and so you're going to accept those. So you end up accepting more numbers where your function is large and fewer where your function is small, which is the goal. And so we need, we require this for our model that we can generate pseudo data. Okay, but any PDF uh, that's well defined, you can generate pseudo data. And, of course, holding data fixed gives us a likelihood of theta given x. Not yet a probability. Right? 
Now, um, <clears throat> sometimes you'll end up with a likelihood, but not the PDF, right? Maybe you get that from a paper, or they publish their likelihood or something. A likelihood doesn't necessarily allow you to generate pseudo-data, so it can't be considered a full model, okay? Okay, so, great. Um, this seems pretty straightforward, and you might be thinking, well, look, if you're an experimentalist, uh, you should know how your detector works. Uh, surely this is no big deal, right? Generating a model for various outcomes. Uh, it turns out it's really hard, okay? And most of the work that we call statistics is actually spent in generating uh, an, an, what we think is an accurate model. Uh, you should not vary your data, yes. So, um, you said you hold theta fixed, you generate the PDF. If you hold theta fixed, you have a PDF, right? Think of the model as a set of PDFs, each okay. one, one for each different value of theta, an infinite set of PDFs. Okay. Um, all right, and in fact, we don't know what p of x given theta is, right? We don't know. Uh, if we knew what this was, if we could write down an analytic function, for example, or even a closed form numer numerical function or something, to evaluate th what th this is for Atlas, that would be tremendously helpful. Right? We do not have this model. Um, why not? Why is it so difficult? I mean, it's not like we don't understand what happens when a muon hits a piece of copper, right? or when two protons collide. We have reasonable ideas for how these things work. Why don't we have this statistical model, which I'm telling you is absolutely essential for doing statistics at the LHC? Well, the reason is that there's a lot of unobserved latent variables. Okay? Because we can write p of x given theta as the integral over dz p of x comma z given theta. <coughs> where z are unobserved latent variables. For example, um, unknown parton momenta, right? We observe partons at the LHC, we see jets and we can measure their momentum. That is not an actual knowledge of what the parton momenta are, right? So. Uh, we need the, to know the parton momenta in order to evaluate matrix elements and stuff like that. We don't observe those things, right? So what we need to do is integrate over all possible parton momenta, right? Which we do not measure, right? It's constrained somewhat by the things we do measure, right? Um, or some things that we just miss, right? Sometimes we miss invisible particles, like neutrinos or dark matter, right? So there are things we do not know about what happened in a specific event or over our entire set of data. And so just very generally, we have to say that there are unobserved latent variables. And not only are these, but, and in general, this integral is intractable, okay? Uh, let's think about why this integral is intractable. Uh, no, most generally, you're right, it should depend on theta. Uh, the latent variables, yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, because if you think of z as the part-time momentum, then it certainly depends on theta, yeah. Uh, so let's think of an example. Um, you see how easy it is to not be able to evaluate, to write down your statistical model, okay? Thank you. 
so going around the internet recently is this um, cool video uh, showing the central limit theorem, essentially, where you drop a ball on down some pegs, right? Imagine a set of pegs, right? Or maybe you've played this game at the arcade, right? You drop uh, a ball here, and it hits a peg, and it can either go left or right, and then down here, left or right, and down here you accumulate all the balls, and in this video they drop, you know, a thousand balls or whatever, and then you get a nice uh, Gaussian distribution or whatever, okay? Uh, so let's think about how to build the model. So this would be our X, right? Where the balls land down here is our model, uh, is, is our observed data. So let's think about how to build um, a model of this, okay? If this was our experiment, right? If it was just as simple as that. Okay, so... Um, P of X, where X is where the balls just distribute, um, given theta, right? And so, what would theta be here? Let's say that theta is uh, the probability to go right, right, and one minus theta is the probability to go left, okay? So every time a ball hits a pin on its way down, it either bounces right with probability of theta or left with probability one minus theta, okay? So that's, our, that's the parameter in our model, right? And maybe you say it's 50% or maybe you say it's less. Um, you can have different models, all right? And so what we need to do is integrate over all, all paths, right? All, unobserved paths z, the probability of x z, right, um, given theta dpz, right. Okay, now if, um, if we know that every pin is the same, right, if every pin is the same, right, then this is a well-studied problem. It's a sequence of choices of probability theta or one minus theta. It's like flipping a coin, right? You have a probability of heads or tails at a certain rate at every point, right? And um, so at the last row here, say we have n rows, right? We have n rows. Okay, so each ball arrives in bin x in bin x, if and only if it took x right turns. Okay, and the turns can be anywhere, right? And, this, and so this is a well-solved pro... These two x's? Um, well, we call this zero. Okay. All right, so that would be bin zero. So you're having bin zero if you take zero turns? Um, well, there's a combination, right? Um, uh, I guess if the sum of the turns is equal to zero, um, let's see. Arrive in bin x. Yeah, yeah. If it's if it's a right minus left equals x, is that the right sign, or is it left minus right? I think that's correct. Um, okay, and so this is so here we have this is like our understanding of the mi of the microphysics, right? We understand what happens when a ball hits a pin. It either goes left or goes right, we understand the probability of it. So this is like analogous to what happens when um, a muon hits a block of copper. You have some understanding of what happens. 
However, do you understand the way to describe the distribution of all of these possible paths, all the accumulations of all of these choices together when it gets down to the bottom? For this one case, where you have a series of decisions where all the probabilities are the same, then we can do it, right? It's a well-studied problem, and people have figured it out. And we can get a description, right? It's just the binomial distribution. And this takes into account all the possible wiggles left and right, can go all the way left and then go all the way right, and adds up all those different possibilities. Um, and so we can actually write down the model, right? So this would be our model, right? In this one case where we know where every pin acts the same way, and so we can write this thing down, okay? N is the number of rows. Sorry, let me twist my question considered to be one of the parameters of a model? This factors into the probability? Hmm. That's something of a philosophical question. Um, it's a um, part of the design of the experiment, right? Sure, I don't see any reason why you couldn't put it in group, considered to be part of the, part of a the theoretical parameters. Well, it's more the experimental design. Because the probability is obviously going to depend on the number of rows, the spacing between things, and so on and so on. But P of X given data doesn't obviously include that information anywhere until you write out your model. Yeah, um, you could say... Yeah, I'm not sure where you would put it or why you need to know. Mm. That's an interesting philosophical question. I need to put a pin in it and I'll think about it and come back to it. So if that's your expression for the probability, yes. that number of right turns should be x start counting zero or Right, yes, thank you. That's why I wrote that down originally. Um, so if zero is from the far left, let's just make sure that's true, then the probability of x equals zero would be 1 minus theta to the n times n. All right, so the extreme cases uh, would be x equals 0 or x equals n, not 0, right? Yeah. Thank you. All right, so this would be x equals 0, All right? Because the extreme cases here are, it goes from 0, it has to go from 0 to n, All right? And so x equals n over 2 is the median case. And then in which case, yeah, thank you. Sorry? Yeah, maybe it's left or right. Um, yeah. Okay, the point is, you can construct a theory um, that describes your observed data x. And you can build that up from your model of the individual interactions, right? And we believe the binomial expression describes this, uh, describes this situation. Okay. Now, what happens if instead uh, you have a more compl a slightly more complicated situation, right? Okay. What if you have a slightly more complicated situation where the probability to go left or right depends? on where you are, right? Like maybe every pin is a little different, right? Depends on the layer or the, the condition of the pin or, you know, every pin has been abused in different ways by the people who play at this arcade or something. Okay, 
So we still have probability of x given theta is integral over all possible paths. Probability of x comma z theta dpz, the, the, all the different paths here, right? Um, but if this theta now depends on, you know, the pin, pin location, then we can no longer simplify this analytically, right? Uh, these are paths. I don't know how you prefer to write path integrals, but just integrate over all the possible unobserved paths, right? You don't see what happens to the ball. There's all the different, the, it's the latent variables, all different possible ways that you could get to a various x, right? And so if you make this just slightly more complicated, so it's supposed to be a comma, so that things are, um, things depend on which pin i and j, the, the probabilities vary, right? Now you have a whole set of probabilities, right? Um, different thetas for every pin, then you no longer know how to simplify this integral, to do this integral into something that you can just write down, right? Um, but all hope is not lost, right? Doesn't mean that you can't still do statistics. It just means that you're a little bit more limited and you have to play some games, right? situation we're in is that we have some parameters, theta, and then we have essentially like a black box, right? There's a black box, something happened, we call that z, and then we have our observables x, right? Um, and so what can we do? Well, we can't, we don't have an expression that says given theta, here's your PDF, right? Um, but what we can do is we can generate observations. And we can also simulate observations, right? Imagine in this scenario, you wanted to know uh, what the various possible outcomes were, you might build a simulator. It's a very pretty simple thing, right? And you could say, well, I'm going to dial in various values of theta. I'm going to see what the distributions are for x, right? And you might say, well, here's x. Uh, for some value of theta, I get this, right? This is theta 0. And for another value of theta, I get something crazy, theta 1. And so for another value of theta, right, I get this. And so if you can describe this in simulation, or you have a, a lot of these things you can do the, the observations with, then you can do this. You can go forward, right? Um, you can generate a lot of example distributions. And so this is the situation we find ourselves in in particle physics, right? It's completely analogous because while we understand a lot of the microphysics, right, we have programs like Géant that tell you exactly what happens when a photon hits a strip of silicon, right? We don't have a full model of the Atlas detector, right? Um, this thing we don't know, right? It's an integral over parton momentum, right? And then there's the integral over the y um, you know, showering. We certainly don't observe the products of the showering. And then there's the integral, I don't want to use dx, I don't know, dw for uh, hadronization, right? And then there's the integral, I don't know, dq over various bits of the detector, right? All of these things that we do not observe, right, to construct this uh, part on to construct this full model in an analytical way, um, 
in the way for the, the simpler ball drop example, we would need to know how to do all of these integrals, right? Right, we need to be able to integrate over all of these unobserved things in order, all the various paths in order to do this. And this is much more complicated than just even the simple ball drop experiment, which is already intractable. I mean, think about what happens when a photon hits a piece of matter, right? A photon is going to, you know, um, you might uh, pair produce, right? E plus, E minus, and these guys radiate, and these guys pair produce. You get an EM shower, right? And you have to follow all of these various things. And the number, the dimensionality of this integral is huge and variable, right? The number of particles you have to track through this integral grows and is different ev for every single example. Uh, so the, doing these integrals seems uh, essentially impossible um, to me. And so I don't see how, we, frankly, how we could ever, ever get to the place where we can do it. But you know, physics is this game of sort of shells, right? Where you have an understanding of the microphysics at one level, and then you can somehow magically get an equation which describes things analytically at another level, right? Um, you know, you don't need to understand particle physics to do classical mechanics, right? We have these equations which are very beautiful and compact and describe Newtonian physics um, without understanding all the gooey stuff that happens underneath. Essentially, that is uh, a massive integral over all the things we don't know. When you shoot a cannonball over your uh, enemy's um, castle walls, you don't need to be able to do the, the parton showering integrals for the protons that are colliding in the atmosphere, right? So somehow, sometimes it's possible. We're not there yet. I leave that to the theorists in the audience to eventually uh, come up with a way to integrate over all of these unobserved things so that we can have an analytic expression for Atlas, right? Um, but, but we don't, right? So the way that I understand people deal with this kind of thing, when for example, you're testing whether or not a medication helps with this specific condition or whatever, and there are going to be all sorts of different variables in the people that you can't, you know, track or control for or anything. You know, you can't, you know, track of an inferior process. Uh -huh. This is by having a large enough sample size as to basically mean that any minor individualities are overwhelmed by the fatality. Is there any, is it not doing anything with Atlas, but could it be stupid amounts of data, or is there a reason why you couldn't do something like that? Yeah, I mean, essentially, I'm about to describe essentially what you just um, proposed. I mean, the question was, uh, sometimes in medicine you don't understand how things work, so you test it on the general population uh, to see what happens. Um, the analogy here would be, you need to be able to predict what happens for various theories, right? So there, I guess you'd be trying different drugs on people to see the different outcomes. Um, and that's essentially what we do here, is we try various scenarios, right? Just like saying you have various theory parameters, um, theta, what are the distribution of outcomes like for x for those different theory parameters? Um, all right, so this is why the Monte Carlo is so valuable, right? So one of the most important, the core methods for building our model is to use simulation, okay? Um, and the procedure essentially is one, Generate parton level information. Okay, so given um, some theory model, right, Susie, whatever, can you generate parton four vectors, right? And this is, a, to me, still incredible that we're even at this place. Um, it used to be that if you constructed a new theory, it took a theory grad student, a PhD, to write a piece of computer code that could generate four vector for partons that came out of collisions for that arbitrary theory. Uh, now, you code it up in, in, uh, in Lagrangian, pump it into MadGraph, you can have them in an afternoon, right? That's, that's progress in science. Uh, my wife is a biologist, and they're always seeing this kind of progress. Like, you do a PhD, it takes five years to do some kind of experiment, I don't know, sequencing or whatever, 
Five years later, there's a little box that sits on your desk, and you press a button, and it happens in an afternoon. And that allows you to think about bigger questions and do harder things. And you spend a PhD doing that, and then five years later, somebody can do your whole PhD in a button push, right? Uh, that, to me, is progress, right? And so the fact that we can now do a PhD in an afternoon, theory P what used to be a theory PhD in an afternoon, automated, that's progress. And you should ask, like, what's the equivalent of progress in experimental particle physics? Because uh, I did my PhD by understanding a single final state and writing a whole thesis about it and understanding the backgrounds. That's the same thing people were doing 40 years ago. Um, so in that sense, um, theoretical physics has accomplished something I think experimental physics hasn't uh, in terms of moving the field forward. <laughs> uh, I, it's true, right? I mean, uh, Tillman knows very well. There are some people who tried to move experimental physics forward so that what used to be a, a theory PhD is now an afternoon, but there's a lot of resistance to that. Anyway, um, that's a whole other philosophical conversation we're going to have over beer sometime. But we can do this, right? This is incredible, right? We know how to calculate the matrix elements. This part is done. Awesome. Nice work, guys. If we had parton level detectors, we, th then statistics, <laughs> statistics would be easy, right? Okay, um, the next steps, right, showering, hadronization, et cetera, we don't have. And so we have to do this, this iterative simulation process, right, where we take these examples, right, we generate a list of examples, and we push these an iterative simulation, right? So you have Pythia or whatever, and Delphi's or Jayant or whatever, right? These are all tools. And at the end, you have a list of examples. All right? What are you going to do with a list of examples? It's like over there, you say, well, for various values of theta for my ball drop, I can generate different outcomes, okay? <coughs> so you can generate uh, um, a bunch of examples of what might happen at the LHC if you have a various, uh, a certain theory, right? How does that relate to our need to have a statistical model? Well, you can use your examples to recover a statistical model as long as x is very, very, is, is low dimensional, okay? If your data x have low dimensionality, call it d, you know, less than or equal to 3 maybe, then you can recover p of x, p of x given theta. How do you do it? Well, there's various approaches, right? The dumbest approach is make a histogram. Right? You have some observable x, and you say, well, um, here's my theory, right, my big bins, and here's my theory, predicts this, right? And the standard model predicts uh, this, whatever, right? Um, what do you have here? What are you really doing when you make a histogram? Is you're constructing a model, right? You're saying, this is my distribution of possible outcomes given my theory, right? This is a statistical model. So we don't know how to, you can't write down an expression to calculate this um, a priori. You couldn't say, given my theory for, you know, jet PT or invariant mass of jet pairs or whatever your observable is, it's very difficult to know how to write down a function that describes that, but you generate enough examples, you can cluster them together, and you can see which ones are more likely to come than others for various examples, right? This is why the Monte Carlo model is so powerful, um, because it can. This only works for low dimensionality, right? Why does it only work for low dimensionality? Well, how many examples do you need to characterize a distribution? You know, it's, uh, if you have a one-dimensional distribution, call it 100, right? maybe approximately. It depends on the complexity of the distribution, et cetera, but order of magnitude 100, right? 
for d equals 1, right? For d of something else, right? Um, for, for, for d greater than 1, how many do you need, right? You need n to the d, right? Because you need to describe all of the correlations in different variables, right? You have x1 and x2. You have some complicated shape for one theory and a complicated shape for another theory. You don't just want to describe the projections in x1 and in x2. You want to describe all of the correlations as well. That's going to take each of these bins, if it's going to have the same number of examples in it, you need, you have a uh, hundred times a hundred bins, right? Now take this to dimensionality of, so that's not bad for dimensionality of two, maybe three, right? What's the dimensionality of the atlas detector? A right? hundred million. So to fully characterize the output of your theory at the rawest level of the atlas detector requires a 100 to the hundred million simulated events, okay? That's many more events than the number of particles in the universe. And so you're going to be waiting on those grid jobs a long time. This is why this um, strategy for describing the statistical model is frustrating, right? Because it limits you to doing low dimensional examples. All right. Um, now there are other things you could do other than just histograms, right? You can be a little bit more clever about it. All right? You can say, well, I will do um, a kernel density estimate, okay, and if you think about what you're doing when you make a histogram, essentially every individual simulated event falls in a single bin, and what you're doing is you're putting down a little square blob of PDF, right, you're saying I'm an, every event corresponds to a little square blob of PDF, and I'm just going to add them all up, right? Well, you might think, well, why should they be square blobs of PDFs? Right? Why don't, instead of putting down a square blob, why don't I put down something smoother? Because I get all these weird edges, right? <clears throat> why don't I put down a Gaussian blob, right? <coughs> Excuse me, this is called a kernel. And so then, for every example, you can put down Gaussian blobs, and you can add them up, and you end up with a much smoother distribution. Or I should probably follow the original shape a little bit. You end up with a much smoother distribution, right? Then by adding up all these Gaussian blobs, then adding up squares, because in reality, nature doesn't have edges like this, right? Um, so that's one powerful technique for, essentially, it's essentially a way to smooth your histogram. Um, it doesn't solve this problem, right? You still, it get, gets you a little bit, but it doesn't solve the, the curse of dimensionality. Um, another disadvantage of kernel methods is here you can put your blob, in the histogram method, you can put your blob of data in there and just accumulate them and count the number of bins, the number of entries in the bin. You don't care about the individual ones. Here, you need to remember where every single point was, and every time you evaluate your density, you need to do a sum over every single simulated event so you know how far away is my evaluation point from my signal event so I can evaluate all those Gaussians. So the, the cost of calculating your model becomes really large. You need to do a sum over every single event that you've, that you've calculated. You know, uh, K of x is a sum over your kernel function, maybe it's a Gaussian, over all the simulated events. And so that can get very expensive for a large number of events. Um, Another approach I was right here. Another approach is to use a parametric function. Right? Say, well, I have all these examples. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm going to make a histogram. I have all these examples, I notice it's fairly smooth, what if I just fit a function to this and then I call that my model, right? So you use the simulation to roughly describe the behavior uh, of the expected data 
and then you fit some parametric function to it, which is much more compact in its description, right? Instead of just raw numbers of events per bins or a sum over Gaussians, it just has one or two or maybe three parameters to it. Um, that's a very effective way to do it as well. Okay, so oh, we're almost out of time. Okay, um, so let me just uh, summarize uh, some issues with the th the MC model. Okay, a big issue people have with Monte Carlo is the uncertainties, right? People say, ah, oh, do you really trust your simulation? Oh, you just use Monte Carlo. Or it's a Monte Carlo description, it's garbage. Um, why is that? Well, in, if you're going to use Monte Carlo to describe, to construct your statistical model, to describe your, your signal and your background, then all of your uncertainties essentially come from data versus Monte Carlo um, differences. Right? Our Monte Carlo is never a perfect description of what's actually happening in the detector. And so while we've tuned it and while we tweaked it, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, it never works perfectly. And so you have to try to understand where is your Monte Carlo different from your data and, and can you somehow describe this as a sort of spectrum of Monte Carlo models so that uh, you capture the various uncertainty. Um, I think that that's going to take more than five minutes to talk about. So let's uh, leave that as a preview for next time. Uh, so next time we'll talk about how people construct uncertainties in their Monte Carlo models and how that gets feed, fed into the statistical um, inference that we do later and whether or not you should ever believe them. Okay, any last questions before we wrap up for the day? Okay, well I'll see you guys at lunch then. <laughs>